purpose-driven forgiveness. Uh, maybe I take off of the purpose-driven this and the purpose-driven that. But there is a purpose. And, and so in that, uh, we'll just go ahead and we'll take a look a little deeper in, into forgiveness today. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has also forgiven us. You know, er- every church, every family has unresolved conflicts. It's, it's started with the Garden of, uh, of Adam and Eve, uh, when the, the very beginning of Scripture, uh, conflicts began. And in that, that has been passed down, and we too are re- working or living every day we walk this earth, is that we walk with one another. And in that becomes conflicts because of different things. And many of that conflicts is our own problem. It's our decisions. uh, It's our fleshly hearts. uh, It's the infection of pride. It's our selfishness, our insistence on being right. It can be anger of being wronged. All kinds of things will come to play in area of relationships. And with that becomes a problem and becomes a very, this is a big mess. And so God, knowing all this, in creating us, knew exactly what we needed to take care of this situation. And that's what we're going to take a look at today, is how do we take care of this situation. A Sunday school teacher had just concluded her lesson and wanted to make sure she had made her point. She said, can anyone tell me what I must do before I can obtain the forgiveness of sin? There was a short pause, and then from the back of the room, a small boy spoke, sin? That's where it starts. It starts because of our hearts. It starts because we allow our fleshliness to ride on the throne of that that area of, of ourselves. And so that's what God understands, and he has brought the tools and the power to deal with that problem. And that's where we give purpose-driven forgiveness. It begins in him. And in that, you can kind of look at it, and, and there's two, two types of forgiveness. We have the vertical forgiveness, and we also have the horizontal forgiveness. And so let's just take a look at the vertical for- forgiveness. That vertical forgiveness is, of course, very understandably, the broken relationship we have with the Father. Where was the first broken relationship? Adam and Eve with the Father. It wasn't with them. It was with the Father. And so he dealt with that. And the way we dealt, deal with that is, first of all, is recognizing sin is serious. We need to understand that our ways are not his ways. We look in Romans first chapter that we've turned to our own ways. We want our will over God's will. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, A heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately wicked, desperately sick. Who can understand it? So our heart is a core element of this area where unforgiveness or rebellion will, will reside in. And because of that, and because of his great under, uh, mercy, though his justice and holiness demands it, a ju- that, that his wrath come down on it, he knew that we need a remedy. Until we can understand the depth of the sin that's in our lives, I don't think we can fully appreciate the forgiveness that we have. In Luke 7, 36 through 50, if you want to have uh, you have your Bibles, you want to turn to it. This is a parable that the surrounding is, is the, that uh, Jesus is eating with a group of Pharisees and a woman comes in and she begins to weep at his, her, his feet and she wipes the tear, using her tears, his feet. And the Pharisees are looking at this woman and they're making judgments. And then Christ looks up and he says this. 
starting with 36. A money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. When they were unable to repay, he graciously forgave them both. So which of them he loved more? Simon spoke up and he says, Oh, I suppose the one who forgave, he forgave more. And then he, Jesus said to him, You have judged correctly. And then turning to the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she, since the time she, I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. For this reason I say to you, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. For she loves much, but he who is forgiven little, loves little. The question I asked in my heart, which one am I? Am I the one who says, my sins aren't that great, Lord? But boy, the ones over there, they're going to need a lot of forgiveness. Or are you one that says, no, my sin's as great as anyone's. And I need help. I need that burden to be taken away. And that's what God has done in that vertical area. In 1 Peter 3.18, it says, For Christ died for sins once for all, the unjust for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. So the penalty of the sin was paid. He took care of that element that we had no way of repaying. And last week we went through a parable about um, two people that were, one was forgiven of a huge debt, and then he turned around and didn't forgive the debt of a very small one of, of, of his peer. We need to recognize that our sins need to be fully paid, and it took a great price. The forgiveness of sins in Acts 13, 38 says, Through him we have re- uh, he forgave the sins and he has proclaimed it to us. We need to recognize that it is Christ's work that has accomplished it. For as faith in him, it says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For grace, for grace you have been saved through faith, and that is not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, lest anyone should boast. So we need to take those things, and as Christians here today, we, you know, we've been brought up in it. Um, we we have walked in that. But in Second Peter, it says, you know, if you if you become so comfortable in this work that's been done, you'd be unproductive in the ways that I want you to become. And in that chapter, and we won't go into it, but it lists all the things that you, you know become as you mature. But that maturity can be hindered when you have forgot where the Lord had picked you up and where you've taken you. Because then we really become yielding to him and in a sense wiping his feet with our tears. God's forgiveness is all about his great mercy and grace and that's been preached a lot. But it's no longer the penalty of sin that keeps us from heaven. The price has been paid, but it's our heart condition. So there's two things that we need to keep in mind in this process to receive this gift of of forgiveness. Of course, Matthew 1.15 says, uh, repent and believe, the time is fulfilled, God's kingdom is at hand, believe in the gospel. So repent and believe. And that's very key that uh, he has asked all of us, and I believe we all have. But there is one other element to that, and that is we need to make him Lord. Because repenting, turning from that sin, and believing that he is the Lord will accomplish that which needs to put you in the place. But without your heart locked into a lordship. It's fruitless. He said, many, many 
have done wonderful things in my name, but their heart wasn't with me. I never knew them. And so we have a responsibility to yield before as this woman and understand that it's him we cling to. It's him who we get our substance. It's him who we get our forgiveness from. Many things in the Lordship is talking about follow him, walk as Jesus walked, remain in him, hold to his teachings, live no longer for self, put on death, whatever belongs to the earthly nature, kill. Forgive our debts as we also forgive our other debtors. Watch out for those who do not, that you do not lose what you have worked for. Remain in me and I'll remain in you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. He's asking us to not only do those two things of repent and believe, but make him Lord. Why? In Acts 20, 28, Paul said, because he purchased us. We do not no longer our own. We belong to him. We are his. And with that basis, with that understanding, then that forgiveness can really come in and plant itself in our hearts, plant itself in our lives. We will walk in that forgiveness. That is so crucial because if we don't get that right, if we be like a Pharisee and say, well, I'm not as bad then the horizontal one won't work. We will be finding it very hard to forgive others. And that's what we want to look at right now is the, vertic is the horizontal. As those who have been chosen, this is in Colossians 3, 12, by, of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing one another and forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against each other, just as the Lord forgave you, you should do also. You know, last week Justin had used his, the God's word to show a believer's life reflects the mercy of God and that we are commanded to forgive others. And we went through that parable that I just mentioned in Matthew about those, uh, the one who was uh, forgiven 10 million and the one who had a hundred denarii, which was just a day's wage, whatever, he wouldn't let go for his own fellow man. He just hung tight to that. And when the king found out, he said, you will go and pay your debt now. I will no longer allow that debt to be unforgiven because your heart isn't in there. It is not in there. And not only that, and we're going to look at this a little bit, I'm going to send you over to torturers. And I think this is really key, that one area in that parable that he says, I'm going to let the torturers torture you until you pay up. And I think there's something in unforgiveness that will be that in a person's life. An example of this would be a preacher Sunday, a preacher Sunday sermon was on forgiving your enemies. Toward the end of the service, he asked the congregation, how many have forgiven your enemies? About half the hands raised. And then he repeated the question. It was about past lunchtime. And about 80% of the hands went up. Then he repeated the question again. How many have you forgiven your enemies? Then all the hands went up, except one little old lady. Miss Jones inquired the preacher, are you willing, not willing to forgive your enemies? I don't have any, she replied, smiling sweetly. Miss Jones, that's very unusual. How old are you? I'm 93, she said. Oh, Miss Jones, what a blessing and a lesson to us you are. Would you please come up in front of this congregation and tell us how a person can live 93 years old and not have an enemy in the world? And she tottered her way up to the front and turned around and faced the congregation and said, I outlived those old bags. <laughs> there is an example of a heart that doesn't get it. We need to have an unforgiving heart. With that verticalness, after he has, I mean, he's taking care of the verticalness, and with that horizontal, we have no reason 
no excuse but to forgive. It will display the condition of our heart. And what is the condition of a heart that won't forgive? It's a hard heart. When I go back to that one parable about the torturers, this is what happens when you don't forget, unforgive. Or when you don't forgive, you have unforgiving. You give Satan a foothold. In Ephesians 4, 2, 6 says, Be angry, angry and do not yet sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Why? Because Satan is a roaring lion seeking who he can devour. He is looking for a hardened heart that is ripe for him to do his bidding. That's a torturer in an unyielding heart who wants to cling on to a hurt, anger, will run the risk of Satan getting a foothold in your life leads to bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springs up causing trouble, and by it many be defiled. How many do you know of people who have become very bitter because of things that has happened in their life? And they cling on to it. And God's saying, you need to let it go. I've forgiven you vertically beyond 10 million. There is no value of worth that you can put on what God has done through his son. And he's looking, he says, you're not letting this element go and give it to me. You're holding on to it. Bitterness will destroy also, it tarnishes the Lord's name in 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are ambassadors for Christ. God is making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God and one another. Without having forg uh, forgiveness for one another, what is the reflection of God's people? What kind of witness are you showing when, when you say, Christ died for you? He gave his life for you. He forgave you. And now I'm an ambassador. But I'm going to hold this, this hurt. I'm going to hold this bitterness. It doesn't bold well as far as us giving God his glory. It causes you to forfeit God's forgiveness. In Matthew 6, 15, it says, but you do not, if you do not forgive others, then your father will not forgive your transgressions. Ouch. Fairly direct. It also proves that we're not truly converted. In Galatians 5, 20 through 21, it says, strife, disputes, factions, and things like these, of which I forewarned you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5.1 says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. What is unforgiveness? It's slavery. It's slaving yourself into a prison. There is an example that came from the seminar. And it says, as we are hurt, or things have, people have done to us, or what we've spoken against someone, to someone else, we think we put them in a cage. And we've got all these cages of these people in and we're holding them because they've wronged me. In the middle of that is a cage and that cage is you. You're in that and God's holding you there. Though you think you have all these other people trapped, God has locked you in and there's only one key that can get you out. You have to unlock all these other cages. 
he'll release you. If you want to carry the burden of unforgiveness and lock other people in, in your mind, you could very well be locking yourself in a box too. 1 John 2, 9 through 11 says, the one who says that he's in the light yet hates his brother is in darkness until now. The one who loves his brother abides in light and there's no stumbling for him. But the one who hates his brother is in darkness, walks in darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And that is the the thing you need to fear the most is becoming blind. We need to pray that God will open our eyes and see that which is inside that does not bring him the glory in his name that might lead us to bitterness, that gives Satan a foothold, that causes us not to release that and may even prove that we're not of his sheep. It's hard. But God, that's the, that's the biggest thing there is in our message. We give others is Christ forgave me. It's all, that's what it's about. Christ forgave me. I was lost. And Christ says, spread it around. I'm spreading it to you. I gave it to you. You tasted it. Let others taste it. Christ did not have to come. God did not have to forgive you. He did it before we even asked. We weren't looking for it. He knew what we needed. He knew that if this can happen, then this can happen. Be willing to suffer injustice. This is hard. I mean, I, I look back and I'm thinking the times that I've held things. Be willing to suffer injustice by choosing to forgive, even if it's not successful. We are always outcome-based. Maybe some things aren't going to go the way we think. But does that mean that we don't do? God never did. He forgave everyone that's on this earth. Sin has been paid. But until you accept that, You believe the message. You turn your ways. You make him Lord. It's no value. We have taken that value. Now we can pass that on to others. Now, getting with when it comes to the point of unforgiveness, I mean, uh, for those who have wronged us, and we're working on that, Matthew 18, and I'm sure that many of us have taken a look at that at different times, uh, and uh, the steps that we use to go through to resolve this situation, the vertical. It says in Matthew 18, and if someone had turned to that, you can kind of go through that. Um, I'm not going to go through by verse by verse, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to take past parts of that. And the first thing you want to do is you want to evaluate this wrong. You need to evaluate this wrong. First of all, is it a, is it a big deal? You know, we get sometimes bent out of shape on the smallest things. I've been down that road. And I look back and I go, why? You know, probably because there wasn't somebody, there was somebody else on that throne and it wasn't God. And like Second Peter, the first chapter, I lost fact of the thing that, listen, how much, if God gave, how much he forgave me. I have no reason to hold seek God's word and and see the interactions and excerpts uh, Matthew 5 the Sermon on the Mount the Beatitudes dealing with this so in Matthew 18 it says you know pray for the clarity uh, pray for patience humility forgiveness before you go to that first step you need to be in the right attitude so first of all in the Matthew 18 is is you seek um, his word you pray for clarity charity patience you follow 1 John 9 through 10. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to cleanse us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we are making him out a liar. And his word has no place in us. Wow. 
<clears throat> are we judging wrongly when we have some? Maybe we're looking at the log we think in somebody else. But really, it's in our eye, and they have a speck. And be open to maybe we contributed to the conflict. You know, maybe we feel so wrong, but maybe we added to that. Those are the things we need to take before we go in and we talk to that individual or the party. Make sure our heart is correct. Make sure our heart is right. The second thing is to go. Go privately to that individual. Matthew 18, 15 says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his faults just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have won a brother over for this reason. Allow God to speak to him without public shame or embarrassment. When you go to him privately, there's wills involved. And even though at times God reached down, even when we didn't give up fully our will, but he works with flawed creator, his creation. Uh, some of us are very flawed. He still works with us. And so in the same thing, it allows without being embarrassed for maybe seeds to be implanted. Also understand that you might be mistaken. Maybe he's blind. Maybe he doesn't see what he did or she did. But when you do that and he repents, you have a brother. In Luke 17, 3, it's an it's a offshoot of this. It says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. And it goes on and says, if he repents, forgive him. If he, if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times, saying, I repent, forgive him. That's kind of a hard one, and that's a whole sermon in itself. But there's one little key area in there that sometimes we miss. And that is, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. There's a reason why that's in there. We don't automatically just forgive someone. We will. If our heart is right, we will forgive them. But there's some re there's a little bit there that, you know, sometimes we brush over and we need to always in our mind think, what would God want us to do? What is he doing in this life? Is he working in this person's life in a way that I don't see? And so if we come to this individual that is wrong privately, and he doesn't repent. It's, there's that if he does, if, and, and, and in that it says if he repents, forgive him. Well, the other side of that is if he doesn't repent, do you forgive him? You will. But maybe not then. You will allow it to resonate. You will allow it to have the seed of God's word build in that life. And maybe they're so hard, the hardness, but it needs to come and work its, the spirit needs to work its fibers. So in that, don't be too quick in letting the fender off the hook too soon verbally by forgiving him if he doesn't. Because you might allow the spirit's power to work that goes all beyond any words that we can say. And remember that God shows much patience for us. Because if he acted the same way as sometimes we do, he would have said, repent. And if we didn't, ah, there you go, you're done. He didn't. Man, he's patient. If you look back how long God's wrath was pulled and kept from you when you deserved it. But he says, no, I don't work quite that way. And he says, I would like you to work the same way. So allow his spirit to work. And give patience. And then also ask God to heal your hurt and give you love for that person. No matter the out outcome, we need to go to God for that which still resides in us. That The one that uh, offended us the way we need to go before him and say, okay, Lord, you need to work in my heart too. Because you know I mean, I know that you've said that you don't want bitterness in my heart. You don't want me to hold on and lock things in and lock other people up. That I need to release it to you. Let you have that. Pilgrim's progress was a bag of sins when he finally was carrying it around. 
and he was told to drop it and it left him and he felt relieved. Part of allowing and the allowing forgiveness to come into your heart, to allow to give it to others, is that bag leaving you that you don't have to carry anymore. And then it goes on the process, if, if not resolved, take one or two witnesses that are mature, that are full of discernment, and that are not of one mind in yours. Don't go get your buddies together because you might be blind. But it's those who, who understand the principle is not making this person say, I, I am wrong, but is to build the body. That's a bigger one than just that person. That person does need to confess, to confess and say that, but it's the building of the body because we are of one body. And then, of course, that process, if that doesn't work, then you go to the church. But that process, a lot of times we circumvent and we first do the talking and then we bring them up publicly and we reverse and then it's all screwed up. So God has established a way to get this, this forgiveness out and to have people allowed to, to come and say, you know, I did do you wrong and I've, I'm sorry. Would you forgive me? In God's way, the body will be built. His name will be glorified. When you are the one that needs to forgive, I mean, uh, get forgiveness from, you need to remember these things. Say, God, I forgive so-and-so for. And name that person. Name the pain and choose in your mind to forgive. Your heart might not be there but you, you form it in your mind. And then I won't bring that offense up to that person again. And I won't be cold to them. That's not, that's not our, uh, what's in my flesh at times. No, wait a minute. You know, they're, I don't think I've really seen them in a forgiving attitude. No. But Christ says, no, you need not to be cold. Don't bring it up to other people. And I won't rehash it in my mind. Live it again and again and again. Continue to reaffirm this in your mind that I have given it to the Lord and it's his. And that way you will not allow the devil to have a foothold. The benefits of having a forgiving spirit and God will bless you in all these Negative feel, feelings of anger, bitterness, and resentment begin to disappear. The burden, the sack, is leaving that which you weren't built to carry. Love, concern, mercy, and compassion replaces them. What? We start becoming like Christ? Wow. You begin to see God's perspective in it? Man, there are so many times I look back and I said, if only I had seen it in your eyes the process, the results, instead of taking it my own. God helps build grace in you to bear that person. He can do marvelous things. He can do work that cannot be done by man. Your relationships, others improve. Harsh attitudes are replaced. The poison of bitterness is removed. You learn to accept that person and not the sin. That's what God did with us. All these things God did with us. He's asking, I can, I did it. I know you can do it. I would like you to do it. And I command you to. Your walk with Christ will flourish. In John 14, 21, it says, He who has commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will love my Father, and I will disclose myself to him. Those who have a close walk with the Lord have resolved to be Him in all situations. And it takes the strength of the Holy Spirit. And we will fail. But God says, you can do it. You can do it. 
I will give you the power, but you've got to give it to me. Let me hold. Because the attitude of unforgiveness, even as right as it seems, will destroy. I want to close by a testimony about a mother back in 1999, Lorraine Huberry. Well, life was drastically, brutally changed. She had two daughters, Stacy and Christy. Uh, they were victims of a horrendous crime. Stacy was 16 years old, was coming home from school, went into the house, and an acquaintance who knew her and who had tried to woo her and she resisted, took her and fought her, was going to rape her. She fought off. She was stabbed in the chest twice and died from a severed artery. Christy, her younger sister, came home later, and she was bound and raped. Then the offender began to strangle her, slash her wrist, throat, and stab her stomach. Then he called a cab, but the cab driver became suspicious and called the police. Christy was rushed to the hospital, and by a miracle of God, she survived. Paul, the offender, was convicted and sentenced to death. Through the years after that, horrible as this tragedy is, you can imagine they were extremely traumatized. And hatred toward Paul resided. But God was patient. Through the years, nine years, God kept speaking to Lorraine, teaching her things. She was resisting. I don't want to hear that, Lord. I don't want to hear that. He says, can you trust me? Can you trust me? It was affecting her in many ways. Her marriage was dissolving. Can you forgive a murderer? One night, she woke up. She says, I can. I can do that. I can give it to the Lord. Then a huge burden she saw was lifted from her. And she rolled over and woke her husband up and said, I did it. And peace came. And love came. And the hurt, though she loved Stacy, God was dealing with. She was no more bound in a life. And her and Christy, though there was anger, met with Paul, the offender. And Lorraine said, Paul, I forgive you. He goes, you can't do that. You can't do that. No, I forgive you. God forgives you. And, but as he was sentenced to death, eight years later, about nine or nine years later, after this meeting, she met one more time with Paul and said, Paul, and he said, just a minute, he said, two years ago, I gave my life to Christ. He said, when you asked, told me that you forgave me, I, I felt something I had never felt before. He said, I came to the Lord. She said, but have you forgiven yourself? She said, I cannot do that. I cannot do that. I cannot forgive myself for what I had done. She said, you must forgive yourself. Well, they went to the execution. They witnessed it not knowing what the, you know, what had become of, with Paul in, in that. The lawyer called her a few days later and said, Lorraine, I want you to know that after you left, he completely broke down. 
God dealt with him. And he said, I forgive myself. So through this situation, though it was a tragedy, brutal, Christy has been healed. She saw her mother in this situation. They both now have a ministry called Stacy Foundation. And they deal with those who have lost hope, who have had very tragic situations. They come and minister. And they pass on that which we are not able to carry. Even though we're rightly to hold on in our mind that we've been wronged. God says, let it go. Forgive them. And they're restoring damaged lives. And they can see hope. And you can see the Lord. We can do it. We can be a people, a forgiving people. If Lorraine can do that, oh, I can do it. And God is patient with us. And he'll keep calling us when we need to. And he says, I have a key. Use it. And you will be set free.